As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, won't you come on down? Come on, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river, Our Good Friday service begins with a note of austerity. The altar is bare, stripped, symbolic of our Lord's humiliation before his captors. With the altar stripped, Psalm 22 is either read or chanted. I will be reading it this evening. Psalm 22 recalls the prophecy of God's servant, being humiliated and stripped, sacrificing himself for us all. Seven of our members will be offering reflections then on the seven last words of Christ from the cross. The reflections will connect these very significant readings to their own journeys of faith and the experience of God's grace in their life and how it has impacted them. Following that, we go to the bidding prayers. The bidding prayers that call us to mind our relationship to God, not only in our church and for our members, but our need to pray for the whole world, for all parts of God's creation that suffer, that are separated from him. And how we pray for that time when we will all be united again in God's grace through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Good Friday is not simply about loss and sacrifice and death. Our service ends on a note of triumph, really of celebration. We celebrate our Lord's sacrifice for our salvation. It is God's triumph over all the forces of death and violence and evil that do separate us from God's love. As the liturgy ends, 
by your holy cross, you have redeemed the whole world. Psalm 22 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others, and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe from my mother's womb. O oh, you, I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lions. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers surrounds me. My hands and feet are shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my sword my soul from the sword, and my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me. I will tell your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in all of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard my cry when I called to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying, The Lord has done this.
Hi, I'm Desiree Deal, here with the Old Testament reading for this Good Friday, which begins in the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi, my name is Jerry, and I'm going to share with you the first of the seven last words of Christ from Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 38. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. When I read this passage, my first thoughts went to forgiveness, and beyond that, all those people who had done me wrong throughout my life. Was I supposed to further contemplate how much I had really forgiven them? Then I went on to do what I normally do when faced with something new. I did a Google search to gather more info. And yes, most websites talked about forgiveness and for whom Jesus was asking forgiveness. I eventually happened upon a very simple reflection activity where someone read only the words of Christ followed by a question. Father, forgive them. Followed by where in your life are you longing for forgiveness? The phrasing of that question gave my reflection a whole new perspective. 
it was no longer about how I may need God's help to forgive others, but how I needed God's help to forgive myself. I am my own worst critic, you see, but in that moment, the guilt of not feeling like a good enough mother, wife, stepmom, sister, aunt, friend, employee, local and global citizen subsided. For me, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, really means, Father, forgive me, for I do not know what I am doing. But I'm determined to continue to figure it out with God's help. The Last Words of Christ, number two. This reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there was deriding Jesus and asked him, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the criminal on the right speaks up for Jesus, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, there have been times in all of our lives when friends or family members have disappointed us. Someone who did not live up to a promise that they made to us or have done something so terrible that you don't believe that they have acted in this manner. Our first reaction is disbelief and then disappointment. How could they have acted in this way? I don't want anything to do with this situation. But what would Jesus want us to do? He set an example that brought forgiveness to the ultimate level. When the criminal simply asked that Jesus remember him, Jesus shows his divinity by opening heaven for the repentant sinner. Such generosity to a man that only asked to be remembered. So let us always remember the promise that we make every Sunday when we join together in reciting the Apostles' Creed, that I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis, and my reading for today is the third last word of Jesus Christ. Woman, behold thy son. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they casted lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. When I think about today's gospel reading, I always feel good about the fact that Jesus was concerned about his mother's fate. However, and I may, 
I may be getting a little jaded here as a result of seeing so many deaths. I can honestly tell you that I can't ever remember anyone asking me to make sure their loved one will be cared for. When we want to ensure that someone that close to us is cared for or some precious item is given to us that will be used by someone for good, we do it in our will. But here was Jesus dying on the cross and giving that instruction to Mary and John. So what does all this represent? Well, Mary is only mentioned in John's Gospel twice, once at the beginning of his ministry, at the wedding of Cana, and here at his crucifixion. So Mary was, in a way, the Alpha and the Omega of Jesus' ministry. John, on the other hand, was there throughout Jesus' ministry. I believe Jesus was telling, them, is telling us in his own parable-telling way that Mary was the past and John the future of his ministry, a ministry that is a precious gift like the tunic the soldiers could not bring themselves to divide at the beginning of this reading, a ministry and a precious gift that the disciple Jesus loved, and all the disciples were charged with moving into the future and spreading through the generations. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The fourth lesson of the seven last words of Christ. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? This is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 27. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. When reading this fourth verse, I immediately think of the many times that one of us has cried out to God from a position of weakness or distress. The following verse from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 5, is significant to me. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Maybe not in the way that we hoped, or in the way that we thought that it should be given, but he never fails. God always provides. We read that Jesus was in great distress and he was calling to his father and is feeling forsaken. We too call out to our father in distress and many times we feel forsaken. We know that Jesus was not forsaken. God allowed the suffering to teach us a lesson. We know that Jesus is home with the father and we know that his love for us is greater than anything that we can imagine. Haven't we all felt feelings that were similar to what Jesus may have felt that night? Feelings of feeling forsaken, deserted, forgotten, anguish, both physically and spiritually? I know I have. I have cried out in complete despair. I have felt forgotten, anguished, and deeply hurt by this world. But through it all, I have never, ever felt unloved by God. I believe in my heart that Jesus did not feel unloved on the cross when he cried out to God. He felt human, vulnerable, and in pain. As a nation, a state, a city, a neighborhood, the world deals with a very real threat from viruses, war, and a multitude of other scary and unknown dangers, 
Let us all cling to the one certainty that has stood the test of time and will continue to be there for us from now until the end of time as we know it. God's love and understanding. One day it will be fully revealed to each and every one of us. So let's take this opportunity to bow our heads in thanksgiving for the abundant blessings he continues to give each and every one of us every single day of our lives. Love. Amen. Hello everyone and happy Easter. This is a reading of Jesus' fifth of seven final words. I thirst, and comes from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. So what does it mean to be thirsty? In our lives, we've all had moments when we felt thirsty, that feeling of needing something to quench our desire for a drink. But we can thirst for much more than a large, cool glass of ice water. We can thirst for people and feelings, something figurative or symbolic. When we hear Jesus speak the words, I thirst, I don't believe he's speaking about his need for water or something to drink. I believe he's referencing his need for a savior, a sign, or a presence to help him at his most human and vulnerable time. So many people, like Jesus, thirst for something more. Take, for instance, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. It is during this moment that we truly understand the importance of thirst. When Jesus utters his last words, he presents himself to us at his most human and vulnerable form. Jesus' thirst reminds us of his true humanity. These are Jesus' wounds, and at his lowest point, he calls out to have his thirst quenched for the living water of eternal life. And just like Jesus, so many around us, many who may not look, act, think, or speak like us, are thirsting for more. So we, as followers of Christ, are called to see and sympathize with those who are thirsty and bring them water. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi, I'm Desiree Deal, and I'm here to share some thoughts on the sixth of Christ's last words, which are from the 19th chapter of John. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. There's a praise and worship song that many perform during the Easter season called Mercy Tree. It was most famously performed by Lacey Strum, and perhaps you've heard it. It references the hill in Calvary and proceeds to recount the entire story of Christ's death and resurrection. And this song even references this verse from John. It is finished, was his cry, she sings. The refrain then goes on to present the most beautiful truth of this verse in this entire story we hear during Holy Week. Death has died, love has won. And then it's followed by that word we aren't allowed to say again until Easter Sunday. Listen again. Death has died, love has won. And let that really sink in. Six words to summarize the truth the gospel teaches us and that we as Christians believe in the very depths of our hearts. Death doesn't have the last word. The pain, struggle, illness, challenges, etc. that we deal with here on earth don't have the final say. There is more awaiting us. Perhaps you've experienced the difficult reality of being alongside a loved one as he or she breathe their last breaths here on earth. I have, and it's one of the most painful things to experience. But we know that's not the end. There's more story to be written. The story of heaven and an eternity of nothing but joy and celebration with our God and our loved ones. So when life brings us challenges, may we hold to the truth we know, and may it give us peace and hope. Death has died, love has won, all because of the greatest sacrifice ever made, Jesus' death on a cross.
Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm offering a reflection on the seventh of the last words of Christ from Luke chapter 23. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The burial of Jesus. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. What stands out most to me are Jesus' last words. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is a bare and honest and true reflection of Jesus' relationship with God. Does he trust God, who has led him to this moment, brought him to his death, or does he abandon his faith? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is the total surrender of Jesus to God. And while this is a heartbreaking moment where Jesus is crucified, it's also incredibly inspiring for those of us who acknowledge our faith and our relationship with God. It's a light in an otherwise dark time. I, like everyone else, have had some dark times, including but not limited to the long sickness, suffering, and death of my mom. Throughout that period of my life, I never lost my faith. I never doubted God. But there were times where I ignored my faith, where I failed to trust completely in God, and I indulged in that darkness. And in my darkest moment, I decided to turn away from that darkness. I acknowledged my faith. I let God in. I let the light in. I allowed God's love to fill my heart and nourish my soul. And like Jesus, that total surrender to God, that light in the dark, is ultimately what healed me and brought me peace. I'm Jen, and I'll be offering the bidding prayers today for our Good Friday service. Throughout the prayers, I'll offer moments of silence so that you can be praying with us. Let us pray for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Bishop Eaton, Bishop Curry, for our pastors and other ministers, for all servants of the church, and for all people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church, and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. 
Give them new birth as your children, and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith, and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, Long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers, that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife, and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor and mercy upon your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be turned over to the hands of sinners, 
and to suffer death on the cross. He who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We offer our adoration for your sacrifice on the cross. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross you have redeemed the whole world. Hello, this is Chase, and I will be singing Lift High the Cross. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Come, Christians, follow where our Savior trod, our King victorious. Christ, the Son of God, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore His sacred name. O Lord, once lifted on the glorious tree, your death has brought us life eternally. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. So shall our song of triumph ever be, praise to the crucified for victory. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore His sacred name.